Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Population Genomics of Sex Chromosome Evolution. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. I am Judy O'Rourke, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Melissa Wilson Sayers, PhD. Dr. Wilson Sayers is an assistant professor at the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State University. I will now turn it over to Dr. Wilson Sayers for her presentation. All right, thank you very much, Judy. I'm very happy to be here. I was just realizing that it's been 10 years that I've been studying sex chromosome evolution. So um, it's something I've been passionate about for a long time. So what I wanna go over today is really the importance of studying sex chromosomes and how their evolution affects medicine today. Uh, we are now starting to really appreciate the impact of evolution on modern medicine. And today we're going to go through a little bit of background about sex chromosome evolution. What are the implications of X inactivation for medicine? Why I think that the Y chromosome is not irrelevant and some conclusions. So to get started, I wanted to go through the CDC most common causes of death for men and women. And it turns out that they differ. The most common uh, cause of death for both men and women is heart disease. And although it affects men a little more, it still is the number one cause of death for, for all people in the US. And so what we wanna look at here is both the order of the disease and the proportion of the population that it affects. So number two for both men and women again is cancer again, slightly affecting more men than women. And although 24% may not seem like much more than 21%, um, when you're thinking of millions of people, this translates to hundreds of thousands of individuals. So the third leading cause of death in women is stroke. And it affects uh, approximately 6.1% of women. It turns out that stroke doesn't show up until number five for men. And if we pause and look at the third leading cause of death for men, it might explain the third leading cause of death for women. So the third leading cause of death for men is unintentional injuries. This is a poor joke on my half, but um, unintentional injuries are, are the third leading cause of death of men. And in fact, they don't even show up in the top five. They're number six for women. Both men and women are affected significantly by chronic lower respiratory disease. So it's the number four leading cause of death for both men and women. And rounding up number five for women is Alzheimer's, uh, affecting 4.7% uh, of women. And you'll notice uh, this is the only disease that significantly affects women uh, more than men, where we look, uh, it does not even show up until number eight for men. So what's striking here is that there are many diseases, the leading causes of death differ significantly between men and women. When I'm studying the genome as a geneticist, uh, the part of the genome that strikes me the most is the X and Y chromosome. And although all of us inherit one copy of each chromosome from our genetic mother and our genetic father, the sex chromosomes are not equally represented. So genetic females have two copies of the X and genetic males have a copy of the X and Y. Despite being so unique in our genome, the X and Y remain 
fairly poorly analyzed in genome-wide association studies. Only about 33% of genome-wide association studies even report analyzing the X chromosome. Um, almost none of them include the Y chromosome. And there's some mechanistic reasons for that. But the X chromosome is a medium-sized chromosome. It's about the size of chromosome eight or nine. And it's striking that we know very little about its role in human health and disease. So I want to take this time to pause and, and have a note about language, especially for clinicians or people who are dealing with patients on a daily basis. So throughout this talk, when I talk about my research, I will talk about genetic males who have an X and a Y chromosome in humans and genetic females who have two X chromosomes. The sex of an individual is distinct from their gender. And while for many individuals, sex and gender will align, for a, a proportion of the population, sex and gender uh, do not align. And so what I want to make clear is that in this talk, when I refer to males and females, I'm talking about genetic sex and not about gender identity. There are some fascinating things to study, both with sex and gender, but for this talk, we're focusing on sex. So the X and the Y chromosome are fascinating. They evolved from a pair of ancestral autosomes that were homologous and indistinguishable from each other approximately 200 million years ago. So in the common ancestor of eutherian and, theory, um, and marsupial mammals, which are together the therian, uh, there was a pair of ancestral autosomes that became sex chromosomes. And we think this happened because of the evolution of a sex-linked allele, which the chromosome carrying that sex-linked allele became our Y chromosome. So we have SRY, sex-determining region of the Y. And over the last 200 million years, the X and the Y have become extremely differentiated from each other. So what's first apparent here is the size difference between the X and the Y chromosome. But we can also look at total number of sites. The human X chromosome has about 155 million sites on it and approximately 1,100 genes. Alternatively, the human Y chromosome only has 60 million sites on it, so it's significantly smaller, and it has 23 unique genes. There are some multi-copy gene families on the Y chromosome, but in effect, and some work that we have done and others have done, we show that the Y chromosome has lost more than 90% of the gene content that it once shared with the X chromosome. In the last part of this presentation, we'll talk about why we think that those 23 unique genes and some of those multi-copy genes are still very important for humans, for medicine, and for understanding diseases. So when we look at the sex chromosome, we'll notice that genetic females will have two large X chromosomes, each have 1,100 genes on them, and genetic males will have a large X chromosome with 1,100 genes on it, and a small Y chromosome with approximately 23 genes on it. And if you imagine that each of these genes has equal dosage, then you might wonder, what are the evolutionary consequences of unequal dosage? Are there detrimental side effects to having upregulation or, or two copies of a, a gene expressed in genetic females relative to one copy in genetic males? And, and the answer is yes, actually, there's some strong evolutionary consequences to that. And one of those is the evolution of a particular dosage compensation mechanism. In eutherian mammals, we have an X inactivation mechanism. So what is X inactivation? In 1961, Mary Lyon proposed the random X inactivation hypothesis that um, in genetic females who have two large X chromosomes, one of those X chromosomes will be randomly chosen to be inactivated. And we observed this. So um, let's see. if we can look at the, at the picture with the two X chromosomes, you can see that kind of darkly stained blob on the side of the cells in the nucleus. That dark blob is a silenced X chromosome. So in typical genetically typical females who have two X chromosomes, one of the X chromosomes is silenced into this ball of heterochromosomes. In 1963, uh, Murray Barr identified these, these blobs as uh, bar bodies. And so 
you can actually take a cheek swab uh, if you have a single X or, or two X's or more, and you can look at it under a microscope and observe your bar bodies or not your bar bodies, depending on your number of X chromosomes. So in fact, the number of bar bodies form relates directly to the number of X chromosomes that exist. So an individual who has an X and a Y chromosome will not have any bar bodies. An individual who has two X chromosomes will form one bar body, so one silenced X chromosome. An individual with two X's and a Y, this is Klinefelter syndrome, so these individuals typically present as uh, males. An individual with XXY will have one bar body because there's one X, in, uh, you have two X chromosomes, one in excess. Uh, additionally, uh, individuals with three X chromosomes, trisomy X, will form two bar bodies. We can also imagine Turner syndrome, so an individual with a single X chromosome will not have any bar bodies formed. So in 2005, Carolyn Willard looked across the inactive X chromosome because it was previously presumed that all of the genes on that bar body were silent, were subject to silencing, that it was a chromosome-wide mechanism and the entire silent, uh, the entire X inactive X chromosome was silent. And what they found though is that the X inactivation is not complete. So what you can see is we'll have some, some blue boxes here that are genes that escape inactivation and yellow boxes referring to genes that are subject to inactivation. And the first most striking thing that they noticed is that there was a distribution between these two. So it wasn't a complete yellow. Uh, there are several genes, uh, in fact, about 15% of genes escape inactivation um, in any single individual. So you can see lots of blue boxes kind of interspersed between the yellow boxes. So this really showed that that X inactivation was not complete and there's some proportion of genes on the inactive X chromosome that escape the silencing mechanism. Moreover, they looked at nine individual cell lines and what they found was even more striking that not only is X inactivation not complete, but it is heterogeneous. So we have the first cell line and the second cell line here and we're going to go through and look at the third and the fourth and fifth, six, seven, eight, nine. And there's two things that show up immediately from this is that when you look across the genes, there are some genes that are subject to silencing inactivation in all individual cell lines that were assayed and some that escaped inactivation in all cell lines. Approximately 15% of the genes on the inactive X escape silencing in all individual cell lines that were assayed. And the second thing that's important to notice here is that there's a lot of heterogene heterogeneity. Approximately 10% of the genes on the X chromosome escape inactivation in some individuals and not in others. This suggests that X inactivation is a process that is still evolving. And we're going to show you why we think that is. And it comes down to answering the question, how did X inactivation evolve? All right, so I've been asked to speak louder. Hopefully, I can do it now. John, please let me know if I'm not speaking loud enough. Okay, great. So to get at our question of how did X inactivation evolve, we wanted to look at genes on the X and the Y chromosome because we don't think that they evolve independently from each other. In genetic males who have one copy of the X chromosome and one copy of the Y chromosome, we know that there are variable categories of genes on the Y chromosome. So what we did is we took all genes on the X chromosome that are functional, 
identified those that likely existed in the ancestral X chromosome, and then categorized those functional genes on the X based on the function of their Y-linked copy. And so we had three categories. And the first is there is a subset of X-linked genes that have a functional copy on the Y chromosome. So they have a, a gene on the X chromosome and a functional gene on the Y. The second category are those that have a functional copy on the X chromosome and a pseudogenized copy on the Y chromosome. So this is a non-functional copy but it still has some relics of existing there. So we can identify sequence on the Y chromosome, even though we don't think that it is functional. And the third category are X-linked genes that have no evidence of a Y-linked copy, but we're confident based on comparative genomics that these existed on the ancestral X chromosome, ancestral X and Y chromosome. So they've been completely lost from the Y chromosome, which suggests they were lost quite a long time ago. And the X-linked genes of the pseudogenized copy were probably lost not a very long time ago. So then let's go through and look at the X inactivation status of each of these categories. And we're going to say, are those genes with a functional copy on X and Y subject to inactivation? or do they escape inactivation? And so we see, first of all, that if a gene has a functional copy on the X and a functional copy on the Y, those escape inactivation in all individual cell lines that were assayed. What this means is that you have expression in two copies in genetic females and two copies in genetic males. Next, when we look at those genes that have a pseudogenized copy on the Y chromosome, what we see is pretty striking. And what we see is that they have a functional copy on the active X chromosome, but on the inactive X chromosome, these genes escape inactivation in some individuals and they do not escape inactivation in others. So they have a heterogeneous escape from X inactivation. And what this suggests is that genes that were recently pseudogenized it's taken some time for a signal to get to the other X chromosomes to suggest that this gene specifically should be silenced. And finally, when we look at X-linked genes that have completely lost their Y chromosome homologue, so there's absolutely no dosage uh, on the Y chromosome in genetic males, we see that they are almost always subject to inactivation, meaning you have one copy expressed in males and one copy expressed in genetic females. So this leads to a model of dosage compensation. And what we'll show here are the two X chromosomes in genetic females and the X and the Y chromosome in genetic males. And this is over a long evolutionary time. Ancestrally, uh, there would be equal dosage on the two X chromosomes in genetic females and also equal dosage on the X and the Y chromosome prior to any degradation on the Y chromosome. And then what we will see is that for Y-linked genes that are pseudogenized, we'll see a reduction in expression on the Y chromosome. And what we expect to happen is a compensation where there's upregulation on the X chromosome in genetic males. Well, the X chromosome doesn't exist in a vacuum. So you'll also have upregulation of those X-linked genes in genetic females. Then as the process continues, you'll continue to have pseudogenization of Y-linked genes and downregulation of the Y-linked gene, corresponding upregulation of the X-linked gene in females until the point where you have tremendously high ex expression on the X chromosome in both genetic females. <clears throat> we know from trisomies in humans that overexpression of genes can be deleterious. And so there might be some selection or some selective pressure acting to reduce the expression of at least one copy of the X in genetic female. And so we can get a silencing mechanism occurring gene by gene on the X chromosome in response to gene loss on the Y chromosome. <clears throat> 
And what we'll see is that over long evolutionary time, X inactivation evolved in response to gene loss on the Y chromosome. So what's the clinical relevance of studying X inactivation? Well, the first is that it's still an ongoing process. Evolution is still shaping the pattern of X inactivation. Um, the first is that we know one of the X chromosomes is going to be chosen randomly for silencing. And it's been shown in mouse models of a, a disease allele, specifically fragile X syndrome, that if the fragile X chromosome, the X chromosome with susceptibility to fragile X is randomly chosen for silencing in the appropriate tissues, the mouse will not show any disease symptoms of fragile X. However, if the alternative, if the healthy chromosome is chosen for silencing and the chromosome with the susceptibility to fragile X is active, then you will get the phenotype for fragile X syndrome. So when we're thinking about disease risk alleles, we need to know on the X chromosome, does this gene escape inactivation? Not only across all individuals in the population that we're looking at, but in the particular individuals that we're concerned with. Further, we need to know about random, whether we're randomly silencing the functional or the disease risk allele. Because of this, individuals may be heterozygous, but silencing may protect them from the disease phenotype or it may make them more susceptible to the disease phenotype. Further, some research recently published has shown that X inactivation is heterogeneous within and between tissues. So work from Germany, Nathan's group has looked at tagging the X chromosome with either a green or a red fluorescent tag. And this is in a mouse model and raising the mice up and then looking at the patterns of inactivation. So I apologize if you're red or green colorblind. I know we're talking about the X chromosome and red green color blindness is linked to the X chromosome, but most of these studies use red and green color tags. So what I will tell you, if you cannot view this, is that for the corneal endothelium, we see kind of a splattering of red and green all about. So it's as if I took a bag of jelly beans, red and green jelly beans, and I splayed them out on the ground. I would see this is approximately the pattern we see in the corneal endothelium. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in this particular tissue. Alternatively, in the next image, we're looking at a cross section of the tongue. And what's fairly striking here is that approximately one half of the tongue is green and approximately the other half of the tongue is red, suggesting that the inactivation occurred very early in the development of the muscle tissue of the tongue. And perhaps the most striking and, and most, um, most provocative is a picture of a mouse brain. And in this one also, we see nearly one hemisphere of the brain being red and nearly one hemisphere of the brain being green. So this tells us that not only do we need to understand the evolutionary history of X inactivation, we also need to understand the developmental timing of X inactivation in mice, which are a model for human disease, as well as in humans. Moreover, X inactivation seems to play a role in the development of certain aggressive cancers. So the bar body is frequently lost, meaning you have reactivation of the X chromosome in many aggressive breast uh, and uterine cancers. So we've talked a lot about the X chromosome and how the evolution of X inactivation is shaped by degradation of gene content on the Y chromosome. And that might lead you to think that what's left on the Y is not very important. <clears throat> but what I want to show is by looking at population genetics of the Y chromosome, we show that the Y chromosome is actually still very important. And the Y is worth studying. So when we look at genetic variation across human Y chromosomes, 
we see that not only is the Y chromosome very small, so it has reduced gene content, but genetic variation is reduced. Y chromosomes across human populations are much more similar to each other than we expect. And traditionally, this has been attributed to neutral processes or to selection. And so we're going to go through testing both of these in a human population. And what we're going to look at first is variance in reproductive success. So a neutral explanation for low Y diversity is that you just have fewer males. So NM is the effective number of males in the population. And if you have high variance in male reproductive success, meaning that on average, you have fewer males contributing to the next generation, then we expect there to be lower Y chromosome diversity. Um, and if we look at the ratio of these, if we have the ratio of the effective number of males to the effective number of females will have equal reproductive success in males and females. If, there is, if that ratio is less than one, then we'll have fewer males on average contributing to the next generation, which suggests lower Y chromosome diversity. And what we're going to do is we're going to test the null hypothesis that this demography, these changes in the effective number of males and females can explain low Y chromosome diversity and the alternative hypothesis that selection is also needed to explain low Y chromosome diversity across human populations. So we looked at whole genome resequencing data. We filtered out sites that we thought were under selection so we wouldn't be biasing ourselves to begin with and difficult to align regions. And then what's most important about this study is that while it's important to look at genetic variation on the Y chromosome, we also need to know what's going on as far as variation on the autosome, which are non-sex chromosomes, on the X chromosome, and on the mitochondrial DNA. So in this study, we looked at genetic variation, or pi, the average number of pairwise differences on the autosomes, the X, the Y, and the mitochondrial DNA. And we corrected for different mutation rates on these different genomic regions. And then we're going to model variants in reproductive success. And we'll look at equal reproductive success uh, between genetic males and genetic females with this ratio of effective males to effective females of one, and then increasing skewed variance in male re reproductive success. And then we ran coalescent simulations to test these different models. So what I want to show is that we, we replicated this in both African populations and European populations. And for simplicity of viewing, we'll look at diversity on the X, the Y, and the mitochondrial DNA relative to the autosomes. This gives us certain expectations. So approximately, we expect diversity on the X relative to the autosomes to be 0.75. And on the Y and the mitochondria relative to the autosomes, we expect diversity to be approximately 0.25 if there's no variance in male reproductive success and no selection. And so what's immediately obvious from these observed values is that although variation on the X relative to the autosomes is hovering around 0.75 in both African and European populations, and it's very similar to expectations in the mitochondrial DNA, which is passed through the genetic female lineage, we see that diversity in the Y chromosome relative to the autosomes is extremely reduced relative to our expectations. And so we'll run our models. And the first is uh, equal reproductive success in males and females. And we see that that cannot explain the low Y chromosome diversity. And we don't expect that it would. Um, we think that probably for most of human history, there's been at least some bias in the effective numbers of males relative to females. And then we'll run through the other models, looking at increasingly high variance of male reproductive success. So if we look at 0 0.75, 0 0.5, and 0.25, we see that we can get a reduction in the expected diversity on the Y chromosome relative to the autosomes 
but it never really reaches the low level that we're expecting. And so you might imagine a scenario where we could look at a very skewed effective number of males relative to females. So one male reproducing for approximately every 100 females in the population. But not only is this not consistent with anthropological evidence, but if that were the case, then our model would not fit the rest of the genome. So we would see that expected diversity on the X relative to the autosomes would be significantly higher and expected diversity on the mitochondria relative to the autosomes would not match at all what is observed. So what this tells us is that demography alone is not enough to explain low Y chromosome variation. And this is perhaps not surprising. So we know that the Y chromosome, in addition to being very small, also does not undergo recombination with the X chromosome. And so if purifying selection, which reduces genetic diversity, is acting anywhere on the Y chromosome, it will affect linked neutral sites, but because there's no recombination, it will affect the entire Y chromosome. So what we wanted to look at was different models of purifying selection acting on the human Y chromosome. And to pause here, purifying selection is when you have selection purifying out harmful mutations, so mutations that disrupt a gene function. So to look at these models of purifying selection on the Y chromosome, we took an approximate likelihood approach. We looked at different demographies for the African and European populations and looked at varying levels of purifying selection. And the first set of models we did was trying to look at just at those single copy coding sites on the Y chromosome. And then the second was to estimate the number of sites affected by purifying selection if we allow selection to act on coding and non-coding or regulatory regions of the Y chromosome. And so the first is that if we look at selection acting only on the coding sites, we couldn't find any models that fit the data. And so if we say that natural selection is acting only on those single copy coding sites on the Y chromosome, we cannot find a model of purifying selection that will reduce the expected level diversity to those levels that we observe. But what we know is that while there's a small number of coding sites on the Y chromosome, there are many other sites on the Y chromosome. So specifically, here's a picture, a cartoon of the human Y chromosome. And these yellow regions are the X degenerate regions of the Y chromosome, so regions that were shared between X and Y. And these blue regions are ampliconic or highly repetitive palindromic regions. These regions are expressed nearly exclusively in the testes. If they are deleted, it often leads to spermatogenic failure. So there's good reason to think that these ampliconic regions may be affected by selection. Moreover, there's 5.7 megabases of ampliconic regions on the Y chromosome, which is significantly more than the single copy coding regions. So if we run our models and try to approximate how many sites are affected by selection on the human Y chromosome, what we find is that with equal variance in male reproductive success relative to females, or with a skewed variance in male reproductive success relative to females, the expected number of sites affected by selection is right in between the total number of ampliconic sites and the coding sites on the Y chromosome. So what this suggests is that genes on the Y chromosome are important. Yay. So it suggests that natural selection is still acting on genes on the Y chromosome and we should be concerned with them. The Y chromosome is not a degenerate, well, it is a little degenerate, but it's not an important, and the genes that are there still play an important role in human health. And so if we think back a little more to the clinical relevance of X and Y chromosome variation, just to reiterate, the X chromosome 
has fewer associations in genome-wide association studies than any other autosomal chromosome. So even though chromosome 22 is one-third the size of the X chromosome, it has four times as many associations on it as the human X chromosome. 33% of genome-wide association studies report including the X in their analysis. Part of this is methodological. Because the X chromosome is not present in two copies in genetic males and genetic females, it doesn't fit assumptions uh, that, of methods that have been built for the autosomes. Uh, the Y chromosome um, has zero loci and zero associations in genome-wide association studies, despite a 1997 Y chromosome consortium that suggested the Y chromosome or particular Y chromosome haplotypes were strongly indicated in heart disease. And because of what we've shown is that these, um, these sites on the Y chromosome are, are not purely neutrally evolving. That means that there's selection acting on the Y chromosome. And we should probably figure out what is really important about the genes that are on the Y chromosome. There's been some recent results suggesting that loss of the Y chromosome is highly implicated in development of certain blood cancers, including myeloma. This may be because of those few genes that retain a copy that's functional on the X and functional on the Y. So if there's been a lot of evolutionary pressure that these genes escape in activation, they have high dosage, dosage from two copies in genetic males and genetic females, it seems likely that those are targets for human health and disease uh, variants on the Y chromosome. So what are the take-home messages? Really that there's been gene loss on the Y chromosome and in turn that's informed or influenced the evolution of inactivation of genes on one of the X chromosomes. So this process is ongoing. We see that there is heterogeneity across inactivation across individuals and we have yet little understanding of how this varies across human populations. And two, that the Y chromosome is still functionally important. It's not a neutral marker. It has functional genes on it, natural selection, Darwin. It, natural selection is affecting genes on the Y chromosome. So what's important from both of these is that evolution is clinically relevant. And just some ongoing work in my lab is that we are working on a computational detection of allele-specific expression. So can we use this to apply to whole transcriptome studies to identify patterns of inactivation across human populations? And can we also look at variation on the Y chromosome to infer global genetic ancestry? So we also recently published a paper in Genome Research that suggests there was a bottleneck on the Y chromosome that coincides with global changes in culture. And so this bottleneck may have also contributed to the, the low genetic variation on the Y chromosome. All right, and with that, I want to thank the School of Life Sciences, the Biodesign Institute, and the Center for Evolution Medicine here at Arizona State University. I was previously funded by uh, the NSF and the Miller Institute for Basic Research, and recently by the Midland Foundation, some undergraduate research fellowships. And thank you to my collaborators on these projects, Katerina Makova at Penn State University, Rasmus Nielsen at the University of California, Berkeley, and Kirk Lohmuller at UCLA. Thank you, Dr. Wilson Sayers, for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I'd like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And our first question is, what is the uniqueness of 23 genes in the case of a male? Thanks, that's an excellent question. And it was the first project that I started working on as a graduate student. 
So we were interested in figuring out what is unique about those genes that have survived on the Y chromosome in human males. And there's two answers to it. The first is that approximately half of those genes are retained on the Y chromosome across mammals. So the X and Y chromosomes that we have are shared across all mammals. They were in the common ancestor of eutherian and also therian mammals. And approximately half of them seem to have very fundamental housekeeping roles. They are expressed in nearly all tissues. They escape X inactivation. If they are deleted, they lead to inviability of the animal. So for approximately half of them, they got stuck on this pair of autosomes that became our sex chromosomes, and they were so important that they could not be lost. The other half are genes that have newly evolved since they became Y-linked, male-specific functions. Most often, these are things that are expressed exclusively in the testes. If they're deleted, they lead to infertility or inviability of sperm. Um, often, as sperm heads won't form properly, or they may not swim properly. So it seems like to be able to survive on a human Y chromosome, you either need to be essential for life or essential for reproduction. Okay, and are there any autosomal loci known where one is active on one of the homologous chromosomes, but inactive on the other? i.e. do autosomal analogs to X inactivation exist? So is there the same kind of inactivation mechanism on the autosome? No. However, there are genes that are parentally imprinted. So the maternal allele may be imprinted, meaning when you inherit that allele from your mother, you, it will be silenced, or the paternal allele may be imprinted and silenced. We think the mechanism for this is very different. It likely relates to conflict over resource allocation. In particular, uh, one of the most notable cases uh, relates to IGF2 uh, growth factors and uh, uh, parental imprinting uh, leads to differential rates of growth of the offspring. And so it seems that it, it kind of evolves back and forth as a conflict, but, but the same kind of dosage compensation um, that we observe on the X and Y chromosome does not appear to apply to the autosome. I think there's no more questions at this point. I wanna thank everyone for participating and uh, please let me know if you have any additional questions. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through November 13th, 2015. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.